All right. Welcome, everybody. This is uh, lesson three of Ecclesiastes, and uh, we're going to be talking about pleasure tonight. All kinds of pleasure. Oh, wow. Whoopee! Yeah, yeah. Um, but let me, let me uh, kind of just as introduction here talk about what we've covered. So uh, some of you guys missed the first week. We did, uh, I, uh, I put out a schedule. We looked at kind of an overview of the book, some of the issues in the, in the interpretation of the book. And, um, you know, the upshot was that I'm going to teach this, uh, this book as a call to faith in the midst of a world full of vanity and absurdity, um, basically. And last week we talked about the author of the book, uh, Quoholet, the preacher, and uh, some of, some of uh, his view of the world. And uh, we talked about his thesis that uh, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. We're going to talk a little bit more about that tonight. And we talked about the cycles of creation, God's uh, cycles that keep moving and on, and we're just a small blip in the time scale of, of that creation. And that that's a, call, that's a call for us to repent in a world of sin and absurdity. Well, tonight we're going to look at the preacher as we go into, uh, uh, we'll start in the back end of chapter 1 at verse 12, and then we'll go into chapter 2. And so the preacher, after he makes these statements, uh, sets off on a search. And we'll talk about two of his searches tonight for knowledge and wisdom and for pleasure. And um, before, we, before we pray and start the lesson, are there any, any questions about anything from last week or anything that came to mind this week? All right, no questions. All right, so I'll, I'll start us off in prayer here. Blessed Lord, we thank you for the great gift of your word. We thank you, Lord, that you are our portion, that you are our pleasure that you call us, Lord, to eat your flesh and to drink your blood and to be satisfied with you, the Lord Jesus. Help us now as we study your word tonight to understand the, the limits of pleasure, the limits of knowledge, and how they point us to you. We thank you for your word tonight. In Christ's name, amen. All right. So the preacher is going to run some experiments, and uh, we talked a little bit in the previous lessons how a lot of the wise men in olden times would they would talk about hear this with you know particularly proverbs that says hear this listen my son etc. And the preacher he is about seeing for himself. He's going to run an experiment, two experiments tonight. He wants to experience these things for himself and to see what's, what's, uh, what's, whether there's anything beyond vanity in, in these things that he's going to look at. So we're going to look tonight at the lure of learning and pleasure and power and accomplishment. Uh, do we see anything, any, anybody chasing those things in our world today? We all have chased them to some extent, right? Uh, but certain, certainly a very um, uh, current lesson in that sense. And one of the things that he's going to talk about tonight is how all of these things are transitory. Earlier lesson, he talked about how this, this word vanity, this idea that when you get to the end of it and you try to put your arms around it and there's nothing there. In, in the short life we have, when you go chasing these things. And he's going to find that's the case in all these avenues that he's going to run down tonight. Now, so the question is, where, do you, where is your satisfaction? Where is your pleasure? Is it in God or in something else? And this is something every one of us struggles with every day to, you know, in some form or fashion. So think for a minute before we uh, look at the preacher what are the things that tempt you the most to captivate you? And we've all got certain weaknesses or things that call to us more than other things. And I'm not asking for any testimonies here or anything like that. But just think for a moment as we go down this trail, 
what things do you have to guard, you find yourself fighting with all the time or guarding yourself from uh, that you know that, if, that, that can become idols uh, in your life? Okay, well, the preacher, he's going to, you know, a lot of people just chase one or two. Well, tonight, he's going to chase the whole gamut of these things and try to experience these things. So let's read. Um, I'm going to start in uh, 1, verse 12. And I'll read the whole passage. I'm going to go down to 2.11 tonight. And uh, so that's, that's a lot. But then we'll come back and we'll kind of break these into pieces. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. And I set my mind to seek and explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under heaven. It is a grievous task which God has given to the sons of men to be afflicted with. I've seen all the works which have been done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and striving after wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, Behold, I have magnified and increased wisdom more than all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my mind has observed a wealth of wisdom and knowledge. And I set my mind to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. And I realize that this also is striving after wind. Because in much wisdom, there is much grief, and increasing knowledge results in increasing pain. Uh, chapter 2. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure. So enjoy yourself, and behold, it too was futility. I said of laughter, it is madness, and of pleasure, what does it accomplish? I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine while my mind was guiding me wisely, and how to take hold of folly until I could see what good there is for the sons of men to do under heaven the few years of their lives. I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself, and I planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made ponds of water for myself from which to irrigate a forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves, and I had home-born slaves, and I possessed flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. Also, I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces, and I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of men, many concubines. Then I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood by me. And all that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. For my heart was pleased because of all my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. Thus I considered all my activities which my hands had done and the labor which I had exerted. And behold, all was vanity and striving after wind, and there was no profit under the sun. So I turned to consider wisdom, madness, and folly. For what will the man, will, will the man do who will come after the king except what has already been done? I went on to verse 12 here. So um, we talked about the identity of the author, and there's a lot of argument about whether or not it's really Solomon or not. But the, the, where does he start off here in verse 12 again? It, he says the same thing as he did in, in 1, chapter 1. Who does he say that he is? The preacher, and how does he describe himself? King over Israel. King over Israel. Um, and so he's, he's putting on, uh, if he isn't Solomon, he's putting on the robes of Solomon, the persona of Solomon. Um, and we talked about before, you know, why would that be useful if you're going to talk about wisdom? Well, he has unlimited power to pursue anything he wants to pursue. He has unlimited wealth. He has unlimited opportunity to go as far down these trails as he wants to go. Haven't you heard somebody, you know, people say, well, if I only won the lottery someday, right, I'd go do this or that. If I only had a million dollars, I'd go do this or that. Well, Solomon didn't have to worry about any of that stuff. 
He had unlimited opportunity to pursue these things that we're going to uh, see him chase tonight. And I thought, this, I thought this week, bless God that he has limited me that I haven't had the opportunity to go down some of these trails, thank, thankfully. But um, that's, that's the point of him being Solomon, is he can do anything he wants to do, and there's no limits on him. And he's also, we know, we learned when we looked in a couple weeks back, he's the wisest, smartest guy that ever walked on the planet. So he has no limitations intellectually. He has no limitations materially. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Uh, I haven't ever lived like that. Well, Solomon's going to tell us what that's like tonight. So, um, verse 13, And I set my mind to seek and explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under heaven. It is a grievous task which, men, which God has given to the sons of men to be afflicted with. I've seen all the works which have been done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and striving after wind. So his first search here, he's going to chase wisdom and knowledge. I'm going, to, I'm going to immerse myself in learning everything I can, in learning everything about this world under the sun. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to and maybe you've met people like this, right? I'm sort of a professional student, uh, but there are people that just like learning and they immerse themselves in it and, they, and that becomes their identity, right? Well, that's what he's talking about here. And he says it's a grievous task. And he's seen all the works that's been done under the sun. Verse 15, this is important, and this runs all through the book. What is crooked cannot be straightened, and what is lacking cannot be counted. We talked a bit about this before. You remember what, what, what's he saying here now? What's crooked cannot be straightened. Okay, well, in, in, this, in this world saturated with sin, where everything is absurd and vain, there's no human agency that can change that. What, what is, you know, we look in our world, we read our news and everything, and there's no way we can change the fundamental sinfulness of man uh, to make things go a whole lot better than what they are now. So he's saying, in all my knowledge and all my learning, there's nothing that a man can do that's going to change this. So there's a limit on human agency. And if, if, um, you, you've heard this term, the social gospel. And if you play the tape back about 130 years from that, uh, turn of the last century, there was very much this idea that by education, um, it was called progressive, there was progressivism even back then. By education, we can make people better, that by helping people and being kind to people and doing good works, that we can change their hearts and make the world a better place. And prior to World War I, there was this idea that by science and man doing smart things, and uh, we can fundamentally change men so we can have a better society. Well, World War I kind of poked a hole in that balloon. But the people have, at times, had this idea about a human agency. If we just educate people and teach people, we can, you know, it fundamentally changes their sinfulness. And he's saying it doesn't happen that way. What is crooked cannot be straightened, and what is lacking cannot be counted. So he said, I said to myself, Behold, I have magnified and increased wisdom more than all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my mind has observed a wealth of wisdom and knowledge. So he's, he's basically claiming, I know more than anybody that's come before me. He went down this path of wisdom and, and set this as the goal of his life for a period of time. I set, verse 17, and I set my mind to know wisdom and to know, and catch the other part of this, and to know madness and folly, and I realize that this also is striving after wind. So what's the problem with chasing wisdom and knowledge? It never satisfies. It never satisfies, and the more you know, the digger you deep, the digger, <laughs> deeper you dig, I got it out, the deeper you dig, 
the uglier it gets. I, I'm, you know, I've got a studied history a lot. Well, the deeper you dig, the uglier it gets. Um, and that's, that's what he's saying here. Verse 18, because in much wisdom there is much grief, and increasing knowledge results in increasing pain. So the more he immersed himself in knowing the world under the sun, the uglier it got, the more painful it got to his soul. And so there's an issue here about, again, this idea that you can't know everything about how God works in the world. We talked a little bit in the previous lessons about this limitation of wisdom that we can't understand what God's doing. Uh, we, I talked about this uh, in the first lesson about the idea of, in wisdom of Job. In, wisdom in, in, in the Bible is there's an action and there's a consequence. And Job's asking the question, is if this consequence happens, then can I extrapolate the, the, mora, you know, what, the virtue of what the action was? His friend said, you're a sinner, Job. Things have turned out bad for you. You must have been a really bad guy. And Job upholds his innocence. And when he meets with God in verse 38 in Job, we talked about this a week or two ago, God says, well, where were you? So for you to doubt my justice and wisdom, you're, call, you're calling into question my actions way back when in the creation. And so Solomon's coming to the same bottom here. I can know all these things, but it's all uh, vanity. Um, and God tells us that there's just things that we are not going to be able to know. He's not going to reveal things. There's a lot of questions in Scripture. Um, you know, why did this happen? And why did you know? Why does it say it this way here and something else here? And we're just not told anymore. And God has put a limit on what He's revealed. Look, look with me if you will in Deuteronomy uh, 29. It's the end of Deuteronomy. And this, you know, I'm sure you guys have heard this scripture before. It's Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of this law. There are some things that God has just chosen to not reveal to us. Will they be revealed to us in eternity? I don't know. Um, you know, there's, I got a lot of questions. You probably do too. Um, but there's... There's just limits on what God has chosen to reveal to, to us. And Solomon said, the more I dug, the uglier it got when I tried to find out what's going on in this world. And, and we're just not going to know. Uh, it's just a limitation that God's put on what he's going to reveal. But he basically says, wisdom is an idol here, and he comes up empty. Do you know anybody that's gone down this path? I think as we, as we talk about some of these trails tonight, people's faces are going to come to your mind. Oh, I know so-and-so, that was the choice he made in his life. Well, you may know people that have made this choice. You know, I'm going to just absorb wisdom. I'm going, my, I'm going to make my life's pleasure, my idol, uh, about trying to know all I can know. Well, Solomon, it came up empty. And that, that's a great point, because a lot of this biblical criticism that's 
this kind of started in the early 1800s and really took off in the late 1800s that we're still faced with today, where it's calling into question Scripture, the validity of Scripture, calling into question the divinity of Christ. I mean, you know, name your, name your topic, right? And the premise there is that man's reason can hold God accountable, so to speak. You know, it's, kind of, it's the creator trying to, it's the creature trying to judge the creator is what it is. And that, will take, and that will take you down this path, right? That I'm smarter than God, and I know all about what's going on, and I can worship. This becomes my pleasure. Yes, ma'am. Those are two good examples, because that's the trail Solomon has chosen to go down on his first search, and he comes up empty. He comes up empty, okay? All right, so now he's going to go on another trail, several trails, actually, um, and he's going to chase pleasure. So you know anybody that's chased pleasure in their life? Right? Read the headlines, right? Uh, so now he notice that... Uh, Back in, in verse 13 he, said, 13, he said, I set my mind to seek and explore wisdom. He didn't ask God. Verse 16, I said to myself, behold, I've magnified. Ver, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure. So I, 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 okay, so this is very much man, by his reason, by his intellect, uh, trying to chase these paths here. So let's, let's look again at all the things he chases. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure. I told you guys, this is the party night. This is the party night. I will test you with pleasure. So enjoy yourself. And behold, it too was humility. That's the headline. This whole, this trail's the dead end too. I said of laughter, it is madness and of pleasure. What does it accomplish? Now he's going to tell us later it's better to be in the house of mourning than to be in the house of laughter. And he'll, t and he'll explain why here. But he, he says of laughter, it's madness and of pleasure. What's it accomplished? So, um, and, you, you know, you probably know people who have kind of taken the demeanor of I'm just going to laugh my way through life. I can make a joke out of anything. Right? Well, that's kind of the, what he's saying here. That's the empty trail. Verse 3. I explored with my mind how to stimulate my body with wine while my mind was guiding me wisely. You've got to ask your question. Now, how can that really be? Right? My mind is guiding me wisely and how to take hold of folly until I could see what good there is for all the sons of men to do under heaven the few years of their lives. Uh, I read some archaeology. Almost every ancient society they have found was had some type of intoxicant that they used. It may not have been alcohol. The Egyptians were big beer drinkers. Um, but like the Mayans, uh, one of the theories about how the Mayans became so organized so they could do big agriculture and everything was that the hierarchy got had control of basically drugs, plant-derived drugs, and they controlled, this is just one of the theories, there's 
okay, but, but the idea that they controlled the, hand, you know, the access to these drugs was how they got control of society. Don't know if that's true or not, but that's one theory. But it's, it's to the point, though, that almost every society has some type of intoxicant that um, is used in society. We've got a whole bunch of uh, intoxicants in our society. Uh, whether it's alcohol or fentanyl or you name your favorite. Um, but he gave himself over to that. So anybody come to mind that's given themselves over to alcohol or drugs? A lot of, a lot of famous uh, people in our society. Uh, you know, you think of Elvis, dies young, Michael Jackson, uh, some of these guys had lots of money, had lots of access, you know, like Solomon, to chase these. He had the money and the, and the access to go get these things. But you got to wonder about his ability to have his mind was guiding him wisely uh, while he's going down this trail. Uh, uh, some of you may have, you know, uh, family members or ancestors or whatever, you know, that have had drug and alcohol problems. Um, I've only been to one high school reunion, I went to my 40th, and I was really struck by the number of people there that had, were telling stories about all the problems they'd had with alcohol uh, through their life. A uh, couple of them, you know, you could look back and say, yeah, you could see the seeds uh, in high school of some of that, but um, it's somewhere around six or seven percent of, of the American population is alcoholic some number like that. I don't know what the drug use number is. But it, a lot of people choose this road, and Solomon says it's an empty road. It's an empty road. A lot of times, you know, this trail will bring you to your, an early death, right? Or you give yourself over to the pleasure of, of intoxication. Okay, so the next trail he goes down. He says, I enlarged my works. I built houses for myself. Uh, I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself, and I planted them in all, with all kinds of fruit trees. Um, big buildings, right? Make a name for yourself. Big buildings, uh, you know, uh, 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 could be commercial buildings, but some people like to build big houses, have big estates, whatever it is. Well, Solomon had unlimited ability to go do this. And if you read in, uh, you know, again, back in the Chronicles, you know, that's, he, he had more building projects than any other king, uh, probably, that was in Jerusalem. Uh, a lot of kings, you know, particularly uh, want to leave a legacy, right? You know, the Egyptian pharaohs would leave huge temples. You know, they all had some kind of building project, you know, in, even in addition to, like, their pyramids and stuff. Uh, but not just in... Name your society, right? You leave a mark, right, by leaving a big building and showing off what you're doing. And there's an intellectual challenge to that, and then there's a pride part of that to say, look what I did. Um, so, you know, a lot of it's done for public esteem. Now, look at this one in verse 5. Particularly in our society today, we've got a lot of people who... Um, I'll say, have given themselves so, over to nature. Have given themselves over uh, you know, uh, to nature. I, I, I want to be careful. I don't mean to be demeaning, but sometimes they're called tree hugger type idea, right? And I don't mean that to be demeaning, but the idea that nature and uh, being in nature and protecting nature and nurturing nature. Um, is, is what they become all about. Well, he did that too. Verse 5, I made gardens and parks for myself, and I planted them in them all kinds of trees. You get the idea he's re trying to recreate Eden. He's trying to recreate Eden, at least on a small scale. But this idea of loving nature for the sake of loving nature, you know, and we see that in our society today too. Well, and, and, we, and we talked about it. this is one of the arguments why it may not really be Solomon, okay? 
But you can also have a pretty hard-hearted king, too, right? Well, you're, well, this this issue is going to come up. This this issue is going to come up several times during the book. Um, I think it's next week. I saw oppression, but he has no empathy for the people that are being oppressed when he's the king. When, if he was the king, he could he should have done something about it. But we 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 talked uh, also I think in the first lesson that you know what happens after Solomon. Well, his kingdom breaks up. And part of the reason it breaks up is because all the forced labor that he imposed on his people, they rise up against this. So to your point, this, this is maybe the background of that, right? Of all this stuff he was doing. But, but nature here, uh, verse 6 is more of this. Ponds of water for myself from which to irrigate a forest of growing trees. So this idea of you know, nature, worshiping nature, um, uh, you know, and possibly the idea of some form of, of revisiting Eden, okay? Remember, as you go through Ecclesiastes, you got to have Genesis 1 through 3 in your back window the whole time because he's constantly making references back to the original creation. All right, let's go to verse 7. All right, I bought male and female slaves, and I had home-born slaves. Slaves were, in many of the ancient societies, a measure of your wealth. The more people you could buy, the, more, the bigger number of people you commanded to do your work and your bidding, the more your esteem or the more your status in the society. So he's buying male and female slaves. He has enough that he's growing slaves, they're reproducing. He's also measuring his wealth, and I possess flocks and herds larger than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. He's keeping score. I, I remember uh, I drove up to work one day, and this guy had a truck. It was a big, fancy truck. And he had this sticker on the back window that said, you know, whoever has the most toys when he dies wins or something like that, you know. Well, Solomon's keeping score. I had more stuff than all the, everybody that came before me. Look at verse 8. And the key word here is collected. I'm reading NASB. Your version may have a different word, but collected. Also, I collected for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. Do you know people that have big collections? You know, there may be people in here that have big collections, Okay. <laughs> Do you know people who are the children of people who have big collections? And what happens to collections but when they die? Nobody wants those. Okay. They can't even sell them. But that's what he's doing. He's, he's hoarding. He's stockpiling. He's collecting wealth. He's gonna, now, in, in the future lessons, we're going to talk a lot more about materialism. But he's, he's keeping score. He's piling on and piling on and piling on and piling on to say, look at me. I've got more than anybody else ever had. I win. That's kind of what he's, what he's doing here. Now, the slaves could have been for hospitality. Uh, what, uh, status in a lot of societies is directly attributed by how hospitable you could be. The idea of the big man that's another archaeological theory. The big man, the, the more status you had, more power you had in the society was your ability to be hospitable to other people. Um, so he's got slaves he, for, that he can use for hospitality, or they can be doing his projects that we just ran down the list of. We talked about the flocks and the herds, the silver and the gold. Um, look at the next verse here, verse 8. I provided for myself male and female singers, in the, and then he goes on the pleasures of men. But catch that, male and female singers. Do you know people that give themselves over to music? 
Now, Paul challenged me last week. He was talking about dust in the wind and everything. And I thought, and when I was reading this, I thought of that there's a lyric in the Boston song, um, More Than a Feeling. He says, I hide myself in my music, forget the day. The idea that you're completely absorbed by music. And, and I, I, I knew a guy like this in, in uh, school, you know, just completely about music. And, and, and that was his life, you know, was music. But Solomon went down that route too. And then the one he's most famous for, um, the pleasures of men, many concubines. So this, what's Solomon probably most famous for, right? 700 wives and 300 concubines. But who's counting, right? right? And, and he may have set the record here. I don't know that. Um, but other uh, rulers in history, uh, Genghis Khan, uh, they've done DNA studies, and he impregnated thousands of women. A, a, a lot of the population of Asia has DNA that comes from Genghis Khan. All over the world. All over the world. True. True story here. So this Solomon's not completely unique in this, but the point here, he's given himself over to sex. You think about people, even in our news today, this Epstein character in, in some of this thing, right? Just gave himself completely over to sex. Well, Solomon went down that trail. Verse 9, here he is. Then I became great and increased more than all who preceded me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also stood by me. So he's claiming he's kept a level head through all this. But he's claiming he's, he's the big guy. Right? Oh, I, got, I got to the top. I got, you, know, you may have met some of these people in your work life. I got to the top. Right? And I was willing to do anything to get there, perhaps. But Solomon's claiming power here. Power and authority is what he's talking about in verse 9. And power and authority can be very intoxicating. You know, more than drugs or sex, maybe, for some people. But to be in control, to have the power, to be able to do, tell people what to do, uh, that can be very intoxicating. So he's gone down the whole trail here. So did any faces come to mind, the people you know in life or have read about or heard about that went down some of these trails? Usually one trail is enough for any person. Solomon claims that he went down all of these trails. Um, uh, he was 70. He died at 70. He died, he died, David died at 70 and Solomon died at 70, I believe. Um, but, but, but you kind of get the idea that he was uh, road, hard, road hard and put up wet, you know, when you, when you think about these uh, adventures that he has here. He's, he, he's had a few of these trails, I think. Well, yeah. What I mean is that he stands up and literally before the microphone will make these kind of bold, similar to what we're seeing right here. Yep. Well, let me let me um, let me take you to uh, Proverbs thirty-one, um, uh, two to nine, and uh, in your Proverbs it probably says the words of Lemuel or the Proverbs of Lemuel or something like that. People have argued that Lemuel might have been a pseudonym for, for Solomon. Okay, um, So that may be. But listen to what he wrote in the Proverbs and compare this to the trails that he just went down. The words of King Lemuel, the oracle which his mother taught him. What, O my son, and what, O son of my womb, and what, O son of my vows, do not give your strength to women, or your ways to that which destroys kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, or rulers to drink strong drink, lest they drink and forget what is decreed, and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. Give strong drink to him who is perishing, and wine to him whose life is bitter. Let him drink and forget his poverty, and remember his trouble no more. Open your mouth uh, for the dumb, for the rights of all the unfortunate. Open your mouth, judge righteously, and defend the rights of the afflicted and the needy. Did you hear any of that 
in this passage in Ecclesiastes? He went, he kind of set all that aside, all that wisdom aside, and went down these trails. And there's no discussion of sin in any, anywhere in this, that any, that any of these things were out of bounds. He said, I did all these things. No remorse. No remorse. No, no, and he, it, later he kind of hints at judgment, but there's nothing in here that says I worried about consequences or, or the, how God would judge me for these things. That comes a little bit later. So somebody that had the opportunity, had the wealth, and went for it down all these trails. Well, now let's see what he has to say about his, was it worth the trip? Uh, so this, uh, this will be uh, uh, Ecclesiastes 2, 10, and 11. And all that my eyes desired, I did not refuse them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure, for my heart was pleased because of all my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. Thus I considered all my activities which my hands had done, and the labor which I had exerted, and behold, all was vanity and striving after wind, and there was no profit under the sun. So he did what a lot of people would sure wish they had the opportunity to try. You know, if I just had the money or I had the opportunity, I'd sure like to go down that path or I'd like to try this or that. And you've, had the, you've just had the opportunity to interview somebody that had unlimited wealth and power and unlimited ability to pursue pleasure. And at the end of the interview, what was it worth? He says it was all vanity. It was all absurdity. It was all meaningless on this trail. Um, he says something important there in verse 10. Um, he didn't withhold anything, and he was, but he was pleased because of my labor, and this was my reward for all my labor. He got to enjoy things in life because of his work. You know, he talked about all the buildings he built and he, how he took satisfaction in that. This is going to be one of the themes throughout the whole book. God has given us the fruits, of, uh, you know, the ability to enjoy things in life as a result of our labor as a gift. This is a gift of God, he tells us. Um, and, and so he, he, the first, this, this is the first time he says it out loud here. All of my labor, and this was my reward for my labor. But like we've said in the last couple lessons, and we're going to say over and over again throughout the rest of spring, all that is only to, enjoyable in this life before death. There's no, there's no uh, carryover for any of this pleasure into eternity. Death brings an end to all that, that and that's a limit. That's the limit of, of wisdom here. Thus I considered all my activities which my hands had, had done and the labor which I had exerted, and behold, all was vanity, striving after the wind, and no profit. So we said this word, havel, that's translated in most of your uh, uh, text as vanity, it can mean futility and meaningless, and it can mean absurdity. And so he, he's, he says it multiple times. So catch this. All was vanity, striving after wind. There was no profit under the sun. This is a poetic way to emphasize the point. To say that there's it's it's rock it's it's a zero. It's zero and it's zero and it's zero. There's no there's no uh, eternal value in this. Um, but verse I want to take you back uh, hit, a, hit another point here before we wrap up tonight. Verse thirteen, and I set my mind to explore to to seek and explore by wisdom concerning all that has been done under the sun is a grievous task which God has given to the sons of men to be afflicted with. So 
he's saying here that God gives us a chore in life, which is, is to learn how to enjoy this life and, and to learn how to serve him in this life. And again, I'm gonna, now I'm going to uh, take you two places here. Um, again, Solomon's always talking about Genesis 1. So let's go way back in Genesis 1.26 and look at the creation account. What did man get created to do here? So uh, Genesis 1.27, And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created him. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Well, this idea of subduing it is, is, this, is related to this idea of exploring it, of, of, the, of that God's given us this task of, of learning about him and learning about the creation. So I just wanted to show you how this connects here. And again, another piece of wisdom literature is in the Psalms. And Psalm 37, 4 It says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. So that God gives us things to desire, to do in life. This is going to be an important theme as we go farther in the book, because God, he talks about how we have a lot in life, that God gives us a lot in life. Uh, a, you know, a, a, a labor to do, a situation in life. But the point here is that we've been commissioned in the creation to learn and understand the creation and to care for it and to, and to know our creator. And Psalm 37, 4 says that he gives us things to do. He gives us desires to fulfill in our life. So I'd ask you tonight, you know, what, you know, Solomon went on this, this uh, adventure here down all these trails. But there are legitimate things that God gives you to, to do and to seek out and uh, to complete in your life. And have you thought about that? What are the things that God's specifically given you you feel like to do or accomplish in your life or things that he's put in your lap right now to do? But that's why he gives us spiritual gifts. Yeah, to enable it, to enable it to be done. Yep. Yep. And we're going to, that's going to, I'm, I'm, you guys are hitting all the right buttons because we're going to, he's going to talk about this in one of the upcoming lessons here. Let me take you to, uh, it, it, it just builds on Paul's point that God gives us these desires and he gives us these ambitions in life because um, he tells us in 1 Corinthians 10 3, that this verse would make no sense if, if it weren't for this. Get to the right place here. 1 Corinthians 10 3. And I didn't give you the right verse here. Um, it's the point of doing everything with excellence. Do all that you're given to do with excellence. And I'm sorry, I got the wrong uh, scripture reference here. Uh, I wrote it down wrong. But do, uh, the, the summary of it is do all that you do for God's glory. That God gives you these legitimate desires to do in, in life and for his glory. And, and um, it doesn't mean giving yourself over to hedonism, which is basically what Solomon did in all these things. But they're legitimate, legitimate desires that God gives us to, for fulfilling in this life. Any, any thoughts or questions here as we wrap up tonight?
with the man who said the word from Samaria, Jerusalem, Samaria to the uttermost part of the world. And that uttermost part of the world was the Roman Empire. To them, that was the end of the world. Well, what they faced was the, uh, the land of entertainment. And that's all, like the Colosseum, everything. They lived for pleasure. And that is the world that I was, Paul and all of them went into trying to bring and bring it uh, several, you know, well, several different, we call it celebration of knowing Jesus. And that is something else for life. And we face that today. We are living in a world of everybody, you know, goes to a concert, whatever it takes to make you happy for the moment. And then here you go. It's the same cycle, it seems like, over and over again. What did you say? There's nothing new under the sun, right? <laughs> so if, if, if does our culture not place high value on pleasure all the time, mm -hmm. right? Like the Anybody know what Super Bowl tickets are going to cost? $45,000. <laughs> nine, nine to, nine to 12000 a seat. That's for the future. Probably. Yeah. Nine to 12000 bucks a seat. I will not be going to the Super I think, Bowl. I think a box seat's like 25000 Yeah. $5, so, so but, but it just <laughs> illustrates what people are willing to pay for a certain type of pleasure, right? So, so it just illustrates that. So the question I'd ask you tonight, uh, guys, we're on, we're on the mic. We're being recorded. We're being recorded. So I, I just need to ask you to uh, watch the conversations here. So wrapping up, have you tried to find lasting satisfaction in activities rather than God? Have you tried to keep yourself busy rather than know your creator? Jesus said in, in John 5, uh, 6, 53 to 56, he told us to eat his flesh and drink his blood, to crave him that, with that kind of intensity. That's, that's, uh, that's kind of the, the right answer to Solomon's question. He got the wrong answer. You know, so if, if you have tried to live for the sake of pleasure, you know, tonight, repent and trust Christ. Seek his, seek his, his flesh and blood and be saved. Is, is there something that God's put on your heart to search out or accomplish? You know, because we talked about it. what are legitimate desires, you know, that God gives us. So that's something to pray about. You know, is there, is there some unfinished business, you know, that God, God wants you to get done. In 1 Timothy 6, 6 to 10, and, uh, Paul is, is given wise counsel to Timothy. I'll just wrap up with this one scripture. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, 6 to 10. You know, Solomon didn't have any contentment. Right, he's he's chasing this. It's, it's, there's a desperation here that uh, I hope you picked up from last week, and you certainly saw tonight. There is a desperation here uh, to find something that will that, that is something that's not vain, not absurd. And Paul uh, uh, six uh, six to ten, but godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied with contentment. For we've brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. Solomon would agree with that. And if we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires, right Solomon, which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many a pain. But flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. So let's, let's go forth. Uh, godliness with contentment. 
That's the prescription. That's the prescription. Any final questions tonight before we wrap up? All right, well, let's close. Mighty Lord, we thank you for your great word. We thank you for what you would teach us about the empty trails in life. Give us grace, Lord, and guard us from these empty trails that seem so enticing and scream out in our ears about how good they are. But help us, Lord, to live with godliness and contentment tonight honoring you in all that we do, doing all that we do with excellence, hearing and listening to your Holy Spirit, Lord, to know the directions that you would give us. We thank you for these desires, these right desires, to bring honor and glory to you. Amen.